Hey, glad you're here. We are in a series called Bubble Wrapped, and we're talking about hope, but from a different kind of a perspective in that we are talking about the seven most famous people in the Bible, working our way through seven different characters, and seeing the, the, the common denominators in each of their lives that made them people of hope, that allows us to kind of um, talk about different traits in their life. Uh, and how they became people of hope. And we've, we've got some opportunities, some tools for you out in the lobby area. There's a kit that you can get if you'd like to get a, to um, kind of use it to help go along with what we're doing. Um, we're doing it in conjunction with about 75 or 100 other churches across the country, 50 churches in Northern California, each taking this topic. Um, most of them are not calling it, in fact, nobody's calling it Unleashing Hope. We turned Mark loose on the whole idea of unleash, Unleashing Hope. We turned him loose and he came up with bubble wrapped. So uh, we are calling it something different. But in the midst of the series, we're talking about, and I've got a goal for us this morning. For everybody in this room, everybody over in the theater, I've got, a, I've got a, an agenda for you. I just want to announce it unashamedly right here. Here it is. I want to adjust your perspective on what is possible up. I want to take whatever it is, wherever everybody is, and what you think might be possible in your life, in our city, in our world, and I want to jack it up a little bit. Just a little bit, but I want to mess with you some. Let me show you a picture here of, of Mark Averill, Mark, our worship guy. He is with his son, Taylor. And Taylor's the good-looking one on the right, the tall, good-looking one. <laughs> Taylor... Um, I remember when Taylor was shorter than me and running around here and everything. Taylor, this past week, Mark had the opportunity to go to uh, this uh, awards presentation in Chicago, Illinois, where Taylor was awarded um, first team Division I NCAA All-American in volleyball. Isn't that amazing? This is only given... This, reward, this award was, is only given to about seven or eight players a year. Of all the hundreds of thousands of volleyball players across the country, one of our very own, somebody who grew up right here, um, made first, not just All-American, first team Division I All-American. When I think about that happening for him, I remember when he first started playing volleyball. I remember some of the struggles and how he, what, he, hadn't, he didn't start as early as some of the kids around, and so getting on the best club teams was hard for him. I remember when, when he got into college, and then he had to change schools, and then he had um, a, soul, a shoulder injury and had to have surgery and to come back from that and all of those things. To see all of that journey and to look up and say, first team, all freaking American, is just crazy for me. I mean, the chances of that happening... It's almost none. I mean, it's just almost none. And it, it, he just stayed at it and worked. Now, granted, he's tall. I mean, he had, God gave him some things, but he had to do a lot of work. And, and so it's awesome to see that kind of come, thing come to fruition. I mean, and if that's possible, possibly some of you have some dreams that could happen. In 1990, but one of the ways that we evaluate our world is that we put people economically in different categories. And the, the lowest category of our, our globe is called extreme poverty. Extreme poverty, the people that exist in extreme poverty, make less than $1.25 a day. In 1990, 43% of the world's population were under the dollar 25 a day and lived in extreme poverty. What that means is, is that they are not able to have access to fresh, clean, safe water. They're not able to have access to enough food that would give them sustenance for the day. They have no shelter normally or certainly inadequate shelter and no opportunity for any kind of health care. I mean, they live in the category of what we have aggressively gone after. We spend a lot of time and a lot of our dollars going after people in extreme poverty, especially children, because of what we call stupid death. There are people that die from malaria, from dysentery, from starvation, from the lack of clean water. Those are, those are things we've figured out. 
That if we'll just share some resources, we can help with those things. We may not be able to figure out what college they ought to go to. Forget that. What high school they maybe ought to go to. But we can help. With malaria, we figured out. We can help with that. And yet it was, it's a gigantic killer. So in 1990, 43% of our world's population existed in extreme poverty. By the year 2000, 10 years later, that number was 33%. 10 years after that, in 2010, the number was 21%. In a 20-year time span, from 1990 to 2010, the number of people in extreme poverty was halved. Halved. Now, what does that mean? What kind of things does that mean? Here's some of the things that it means. You take eight of the poorest countries in sub sahara Africa, in the southern part of Africa, where malaria was killing millions of people. And there are eight countries combined dropped the malaria malaria death rate by 75% in the last 10 years. Moving people out of extreme poverty, having that number means this for, um, this this will give it maybe some meaning. Let me find my number. 7,256, say that number aloud with me, 7,256, one more time, 7,256, that's how many fewer children died today because of that number of extreme poverty being halved. 7,256 fewer children died today because of the efforts primarily of Christian, of Christ followers around the world, sharing their resources, investing in programs and opportunities to be able to help people out of extreme poverty. Now, let me ask you a simple question. How many knew that? How many knew that the world is actually at that level, like extreme poverty, actually progressing, that progress is being made? I, I, I don't know. I not only didn't know it, I thought it was getting worse. Everything I read, everything I hear is that everything's getting worse. It's worse and worse and worse. In the last four years, eight million more patients are, receive um, treatment for AIDS every day. Just in the last four years, eight million people. There is significant progress being made at the lowest levels of poverty, at the most extreme levels of poverty. Now, don't get me wrong. We're going to always have poor people with us. And compared to how we live here in the United States, we're talking $1.25 a day. So there's, all, there's still tons and tons of poor people, tons and tons of evil things happening, tons and tons of injustice that we need to stand up against. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that we didn't even know. I was completely unaware that this kind of progress is being made. Raise up your expectations just a little about what might happen in our world. If God gets behind some things, and motivates his people to care about more than just themselves. Amazing, tremendous things can happen. I don't know how many years we've been digging wells. I think we've been doing it five or six years. Anybody know? I guess this is the last service. I still don't really know. First time I've asked. Oh, let's say five years. Five? Is that, what do you think? Dan, where are you? How many? About six years. Thank you. Like I said... Six years. In the last six years, um, there are 70 communities that have fresh, clean, safe water that comes out of a well with Westgate's name on it. 70 different wells that you have done. Now, we're on our third well just from our trash. Just bringing our bottles and our cans in. Not any trash. Recyclable bottles. The Westgate team will kill me. The Westgate water team. Just the recyclable bottles and the the aluminum cans. We're on our third well. We can do better than that. I think we can do a well a month eventually. Y'all got more trash than you're bringing. Come on, bring it. Even if you're not giving money here, give us your trash. Say, I don't trust you enough to give you money, but I'll give you my cans. That's okay. We'll take them third well. 
I think we can get to where we do a well a month. And every time it's placed in a, in a community of people who do not have access to fresh and clean, safe water. 70 different communities today are drinking water because of us or because of what God's doing in us. I remember when we started thinking, man, if we could just get three or four wells out there, that'd be awesome. 70. More is possible than you are dreaming of. Now, I know it's dangerous to have big dreams. I know, I know you've been disappointed before. I, I know you're thinking, oh, bald dude, I ain't doing that. I, dream, I used to have big dreams, and, and that is the way it works. Now I've woken up. I've matured. I've become, you know, an adult. Well, I would tell you that the stories of Scripture say, lift up your eyes and dream big dreams. For who knows? God might do more than we think. So let me pray for us. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to jump into Genesis 18, take a look at a guy named Abraham. And so if you'd like to start turning there, you can. Um, and I'll pray for us, and we'll jump in. God, thank you. We give you all of the credit for anything that you're doing through us that is helping folks. God, we are not, we are not sharing these numbers. We are not, we are not claiming these things um, as if to say that we accomplish this on our own. We are, we are simply standing in praise of what you've allowed us to be a part of. What an awesome thought it is. That our world has changed for the better. All the way around on the other side. All, people that we'll never meet. People that were so desperate for some help. And just our little efforts. Our small sacrifices. And they're very small. Uh, you're empowering and multiplying and using. And so God, we ask... May we be found, as we take a look at this, may we be found as a people who expect you to move, that trust you for things that are bigger than what we can do on our own. May we be found faithful and obedient to the things you call us to. In Christ's name, amen. When you get to Genesis 18, what happened is, is that the first 11 chapters of Genesis are about all these things that start. <laughs> the universe starts, our planet starts, animal life starts, and then human beings start, marriage and governments and language and all of these kinds of things, as well as sin and murder and all of those kinds of things as well. So good and bad, all beginning. By the time you get to chapter 12, God comes up with this plan that says, I'm gonna bless the people of the world through an individual nation, and that nation's gonna come from this dude named Abraham. His name is Abram, which means great one. And he, God changes his name to Abraham which means the father of many nations or the great father of many nations. And he says, it's through this dude that I'm going to build this gigantic nation of blessing. The only problem is, is that the guy's already 75 years old by Genesis chapter 12, and he didn't have any kids. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 18, it's 25 years later, Abraham's now 100, his wife is 75, and they still don't have any kids. He's been visited five times previous to this by the Lord and said to him every time, you're going to be the father of many nations. You're, you can, you're going to be the father of many nations. And there's still no children. And so that's where we are when we get to the sixth visit from the Lord in chapter 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. Now, both of those things are really probably relatively speaking. Remember, he's 100 years old, so he, his hurrying was kind of probably a shuffle. And when he bowed low to the ground, it was probably about like this. I mean, I'm just guessing. 
He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you may wash all your feet and rest under this tree and let me get something to, uh, you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. They say, very well, okay, let's, let's wash our feet and have something to eat. And so he says to Sarah, make some bread. He grabs his servant and says, cook up this calf. Very special meal. Bread was, uh, of course, a daily sustenance. But, but a calf, to slaughter a calf, was a, that was only on special occasions. And so they do that. And, and he's, he's, he's sharing with them. And then in verse 9, it says, where's your wife, Sarah, they ask him. And Abraham answered, they're in the tent. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, this is the first time that the promise has gotten very specific in terms of timetable. Each time they've kept saying, you're gonna, have some, you're gonna be the father of many nations, you're gonna be the father of many nations, but for 25 years they've been waiting. I mean, all of that time, I guess they're trying to have children. I mean, Abraham's saying to Sarah, Sarah, the Lord said we gotta try but there's still no children. Now they, this, 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 these three guys show up and the Lord says, I'm gonna be back in a year. You're gonna have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind Abraham. And Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. And so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out, and my master is old, the idea actually has to being dried up. Will I now have this pleasure? I mean, you just, you guys just keep saying this thing to Abraham, which gives him an excuse for us to keep trying, but we know it ain't working. <laughs> then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I didn't laugh, I was just a giggle. <laughs> but he said, yes, you did, you laughed. And of course, the story goes on. And a year from now, just a few chapters later, they have a son. His name is Isaac. Isaac means laughter. And I think they just giggled every time they looked and said, can you imagine you're 100 years old, you have your first son. He just giggle. <laughs> you just laugh. I mean, we hear this story and we, and we, we hear the kinds of things that God can do. And, and it, we have to understand that we tend to just kind of celebrate the mountaintop experiences. But this journey for Abraham and Sarah was quite difficult. 25 years waiting on a child. 25 years. And that would be okay, I guess, if you were like 10 when you were told you're going to have a kid. But they were already 75 and 50. And then they still have to wait 25 years. This whole journey of faith is one that we've got to understand because faith is where hope is birthed. And if you don't understand how faith is developed and how the journey will kind of play out for you, you could really lose sight and your expectations can get lowered really quickly. Some of you have had great dreams in your past and things that you thought would happen, but it didn't happen on your timing and in your way, and so you've kind of lost heart. But in reality, the journey of faith maybe was exactly as it should be. Think of this for a minute. First, the place of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place where he later was going to receive his, his inheritance, obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going. Here's the, the place of faith. Theologians call it progressive revelation. What that means is simply this. You will know what you need to know 
only when you need to know it. God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, I'd like for you to go yonder, that way. Abraham naturally said, what's out there? To which God said, nothing. Said nothing, didn't reply. Just said, just go that way. Here's progressive revelation in my life unfolds like this. It's traveling by a compass instead of a map. This is so different than what we do. We have GPS units now in all of our vehicles that tell us how many feet till our next turn. And if you miss the turn, it will immediately say, as soon as it is legal and safe, <laughs> turn around and go back. And if we don't have maps, we have topographical maps that tell us elevations when we're, where we're heading to places, how the, the way the terrain will look, whether there's going to be water, whether it's dry. The way of faith is not like that. You don't get GPS units. You get a compass. And the compass says, go that way. Out there. What's out there? Well, we ain't saying when you get there, you'll know. If you want the complete scoop before you'll step out, here's the sad truth of it. You'll almost never step out. And some of you felt a prompting to kind of move out towards something. But as you began to move out in there, it was, it was uncertain. There was that's why it's called, by the way, faith. Faith is defined as an assurance of things not seen. You just can't find times in the scriptures where it's completely spelled out. Very rare. Very rare that that ever happens. Very rare in my own experience. Where do you want me to go? I want you to go to San Jose. Oh, no, God, not San Jose. <laughs> really? What's going to happen over there? Well, I ain't saying. But it's going to be good. Trust me. Here's something else that kind of messes us up. That when we, when we do finally step out into it, we know that the way of faith, the place of faith is kind of this compass, not a map. And the, and the way of faith is, is not around, but through. Or not through, but around. Or through, not around, whatever it is. <laughs> I got the words right anyway. That's the way of faith. So here's how it works. You feel like you got prompted. You get a dream. You get the, a, an expectation of something that might be better. And God says, try it. Trust me. Step in. And then you step into it. And immediately it gets a little difficult. And so you think, what? I must have made a mistake. I'm backing out. Because surely God would not lead me to a place of difficulty. Now, just think about this for a minute. Let's say that front row, front row is the place that God's trying to lead me of blessing and fruitfulness and honor. And I'm back here and he says, trust me, go this way. And as I start in that way, he knows, he already knows because he's a good and loving father that what he's going to do for me out there, he's got to do some things in me first. So it's not unexpected at all. If you have a biblical understanding of what faith is, that it might be a little difficult along the way. Isaiah 43 says this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. This is Abraham's sixth visit saying you're going to have a kid. And all along he's saying, when, 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 25 years he's had to wait. Now, when you move into that, you might move into that and say, well, it's gotten... It's, it's sometimes you do maybe make a bad choice. How do I know if I step into something and it gets hard, that it's hard for me in a good way or hard because I made a bad mistake? Is that, that's what you're thinking. That's what you should be thinking. That's what you are thinking because you are a gifted, intelligent, following right along with me kind of a group. 
Much better than 9.30, way better. Okay, so as you step into it, if it's difficult, sometimes it might be because you made a bad choice. How do you know if it got hard because it was right and it's building your character or it was a wrong choice and you need to back back out of it? In other words, John 15 says this. If you abide in me and I in you, Jesus is saying this, I will cause you to produce much fruit. And as you're doing that, if you don't produce fruit, I'll cut you off and trim you up and prune you. And if you do produce much fruit, I'll cut you off and prune you. And you think, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't produce fruit, I got cut. I produced fruit, I got cut. How do you know why you're getting cut? You're getting pruned. Does that make any sense? You following me? Theater, follow me? This means yes? Okay, good. Think of it this way. As you step into it and you face difficulties, you go into this faith venture, and you kind of trust and go into an unknown thing and it gets kind of hard, then you ask yourself honestly before the Lord, Lord, is there anything in my life, any sin, any habit, anything that needs you, you and I need to deal with? Is there anything, watch this, is there anything that needs correction? Anything that needs correction in me? And the Lord is always faithful. In my experience, always faithful to very quickly and precisely say, as a matter of fact, there is. You're mean-spirited. You're arrogant. You don't think enough before you speak. You take people for granted. Those are just all my own personal examples. It might be a number of different things in you. And then you, whenever it's brought to your mind and you see it, then you confess it and ask God to give you the strength to overcome it. Now, it might be that you say, God, is there anything that's going on? I'm experiencing some of this difficulty. Is there anything going on in my life that, that you need to correct? And you don't hear anything. You don't hear anything at all. Praise him. Say, great. That's what I thought. <laughs> then you're proud. And he'll say, oh, by the way. No. And then he'll say... Okay, so it's not correction that needs done, it's construction that needs done. And he says, no, it's, not, it's this, I need to build more character in you because the things I have out here for you are gonna be blessing and fruitfulness and great and you're just not ready, you can't handle them yet. So I'm gonna build in you more patience, more faith, more love, more kindness, more understanding, more empathy, more knowledge of the scriptures. Who knows what it might be? But when you step into thing and it's difficult, you ask, there's something going on in my heart and life that you need to deal with? If it's a yes, correction, confess, move on. If it's a no, you don't, nothing comes, just don't, it's just hard because it's making construction go on. It, there's some things in my life that need to happen. Now, the timing of your faith, get your handout out for just a moment and you'll see the timing of God's of faith for us and God's plan is never blank. How would you fill that in? Never blank. Never wrong, never late. Those are great. I want to fill it in this way. It's never early. Okay? It's never early. Almost always in my timetable, as I look at things that are going on, God moves always, it seems a little slow for me. But when I look back, big picture, after I've kind of gone through some things, I realize, wow, if he'd have come when I wanted it to come, it'd have been way early. In 1987, Dana and I made a commitment to leave the um, uh, public education and coaching and to join a church, a church that invited us to be uh, on their staff. We had taken a 50% cut in pay. I had committed to going back to school. We had moved into a 600 square foot roach infested two bedroom apartment that was free. That's why we moved in it. And we took our home, our big three bedroom, two bath home that we owned and we put it up for sale. And we thought this is no problem. We're gonna step right in. We're gonna enroll in school. We're gonna go work at this church. We're gonna move. We'll put a for sale sign in this thing and it'll be done lickety split. Well, that house, it didn't sell. So we had to rent it. And while it was being rented, we, of course, were trying to sell it, but it just didn't sell. 
And that house didn't sell for 11 years. 11 freaking years. <laughs> and we just assumed that, God, if we, if we stepped in, even though we didn't know what was coming, we stepped in and with obedience, we thought, well, you'll work it all out and it'll just go quick. It'll go fast. We'll gain patience really good, quick. And that house will be gone. And now we look back on it and say, wow, that was one of the primary instruments in our life that God used to build some character around our finances and around our attitude towards what we own that has allowed us to be generous people. It, it was the perfect instrument for us. It was mostly for Dana, not for me. The place of faith is progressive revelation. You're, you'll need to know what you need to know only when you need to know it. The way of faith is through, not around. And the timing of faith is that God is never early. Now, some things that we might do um, just to kind of some exhortation to kind of begin to try to raise up what if God has allowed us in six years to do 70 wells, what might we do in the next six if he's allowed us to be able to, to build a, 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 a college in Haiti and a giant sports camp in the Philippines and, and, a, and a other things around the world, orphanages and all these kinds of things, what might he do? What might he do? Well, one of the things is, is just one of the steps we've got to take is believe impossible things. Impossible things are possible. With God, all things are possible, Jesus said in Matthew 19. Everything is possible for him who believes, Mark 9. And what, if every, everything, those are all inclusive. With God, all things, all things, not some things, not everything but your mother-in-law things. Everything is possible. What kinds of dreams might you have that you begin to ask right now, that you would begin to beg God, I've got some things I'm praying for God that to do in the next six or seven years. What kinds of giant things could you maybe expect God to do? Since all things are possible, what might you do? I mean, God is working around and, and we've got a, a, amazing opportunities in front of us. This past Friday, uh, Dana and I were invited up to a conference in Sacramento, a bunch of church folk up there, and, and we gathered together and taught. Um, one of the breakouts of that, at that conference was leading through suffering, and we kind of shared our story and some of the things we've learned over the last two years. And um, as I began this, um, this talk, I noticed that an, an adult, a, a guy came in with two other people with him, and they came up after I had talked, and one was an adult son and, and his parents. And he came up to me and he said, um, just three days ago, I was uh, diagnosed with a severe form of multiple sclerosis, MS. And the prognosis is very, very bad. And then the father said, seven days before that, we lost a niece. And three days before that, I lost my mom. And he said, we weren't even coming here today. We didn't even know you were here. We went to a breakout on another part of the campus and that speaker didn't show up. He got sick and couldn't do it. So they just shut it down. So we were just walking out. We're on our way to leave. We walk by your door. We hear your voice. We stick our head in and we come in. So we, and, and God used what you've shared and what you've learned to so deeply minister to us that we can't, this is exactly, it's like you came just for us, which two years ago, we, Dana and I went up there to that conference two years ago and we didn't go for the conference. The last thing we want to do is go to the conference. But while I was at that conference, I was introduced to a guy named Jack Deere, who has been a, one of the mentors who's helped me through the whole process of losing our, um, um, our, the physical death of our youngest son because 10 years prior, he had lost a son. And that guy spoke directly into my life, things that I have clung to now for two years. I know exactly where they were coming from. That in their loss and in their suffering and in their, in their fear of what's coming in the future, God was able to use me. Listen, that's a class B miracle. It's not, it's not like raising the dead or walking on the water. But what are the chances of somebody walk, that, that are leaving and walking by my, 
my, the room I'm in, taking a look inside, hearing my voice, <laughs> this voice, and seeing this, seeing this, and saying, oh, let's go listen to him. I mean, there's no chance, no chance um, that this is going to happen unless God moved in such a way where he directed them right inside the door and put their butts right in the chairs where they were supposed to be. And then God allowed me to be a part of what he's doing in their life. Impossible things are possible if you'll just show up with a Godward orientation of faith that says, God, if you want to, use me. Scriptures are full of God using ordinary people. You are all qualified. There are some of you that are extraordinary. Your IQs are like gigantic. You're really gonna have a hard time being used by God because you've got too much going on. The rest of us that are just normal, we fall right into what God normally does. I mean, he seems to specialize in doing extraordinary things through absolutely ordinary people who just show up expecting to see him work. Number two, believe God has better days ahead. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. The things in front of us that God wants to still do are gigantic and humongous in their challenge towards us. And there are better days still ahead. Number three, replace fear with faith. Isaiah 41, 10, do not be afraid for I am with you. Do not be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. See, we sometimes misunderstand that if we're walking in faith, if we just had more faith, we wouldn't have any fear. Fear and faith go along together. The only way you can get rid of fear, this is a quote from a guy named Seth Godin. He says, the only way to get rid of uh, fear is to stop doing things that might not work. Only do things that you know will work, which of course is not faith because faith is the assurance of things not seen. Only do things that um, don't have any value to anybody. Stop doing work that matters. The right question is not how do I get rid of my fear, but how do I dance with the fear I have? And here's how you do it. That's number four. You go till you get a no. You just go to, just say, look, God's completely capable of keeping you from some stupid ideas. He'll just shut the door. Bam. He'll just close it. So you just go till you get a no. Six years ago, the elders gave me a mandate. They said, Steve, we think you ought to start a video campus. Our campus is starting to get stressed. Let's see if we can't find this video campus. Well, I, I've led poorly. It's taken six years for me to get my head around it. I just didn't have enough faith. I was afraid. I like it here. I don't know what it means to have multiple campuses and hiring other people to do those kinds of things. I, don't, I just didn't believe anybody would come watch this on video. And so I've been afraid. I have backed up. But I'll tell you this. Last summer, we decided. We're going. We're going. We hired Andy, and we started looking. And it was no, 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 no. We wanted to start by the first of the year. No, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, Branham High School. Yes, we've just been going, no, going, no, going, no, going. Yes, we're going. We're going. Father's Day, that's a dumb time to start a campus. Right in the middle, of, right when summer starts and all y'all are gonna go on vacation. Really? Okay, well, let's just say, it's stupid, but we're doing it. We're doing it. We're going. We've said, we have committed ourselves to this process. We don't know what it's going to work. I don't know how it's going to look, but, but we're going to give it a go. Branham's going to start Father's Day. And um, we're going to keep going. That's just the first. We're going to keep going until God um, tells us that we can't go anymore. David faced the giant. Zacchaeus climbed a tree. Moses faced Pharaoh. Elijah called down fire from heaven and then called down rain from heaven. Gideon got his army shrunk. Abraham kept trying, even though he was 100 years old. Okay, that's probably the best assignment. <laughs> but the list is awesome in the scriptures where you just keep trying, you just keep going until things completely get shut down. 
down. Now, I want to go back to faith. Those are some things that we can do and that I hope that I'll model better for you in the future. And that you'll help me model as we have raise our expectations about how God might use normal people like us to do something extraordinary. But I want to get back to faith because we don't have a blind faith. This is not, and maybe so far it seems like it, but this is not just a self pep talk where I come in and I can say, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Because <laughs> here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. You can't. And neither can I. This is not about what we can do. This is about one more thing you've got to know, and that's the object of our faith. This is about what Jesus can do through us. I, I, I got zero confidence in you. <laughs> zero without Jesus. By the way, I hope that's about how much confidence you got in me without Jesus. But if enough of us could surrender to his will, there is no telling what he might do in us and then through us for our city. I just heard a guy say this past week, a lot of people are hoping in the way of the donkey and a lot of people are hoping in the way of the elephant. And they're kind of aligning and saying all of that. He said, don't put your hope there. Put your hope in the way of the lamb. We are followers of the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We are people of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who says, I can do anything through him who strengthens me. Think of it this way. Here's a quote by a guy named Tim Keller. He said, imagine you're falling off a cliff and sticking out of the cliff is a branch that is strong enough to hold you, but you don't know how strong it is. As you fall, you have just enough time to grab that branch. How much faith do you have to have in the branch for it to save you? Must you be totally sure that it can save you? No, of course not. You only have to have enough faith to grab the branch. That's because it's not the quality of your faith that saves you. It's the object of your faith that saves you. Doesn't matter how you feel about the branch. All that matters is the branch. And Jesus is our branch. We are going to reach out and cling to him and hang on and just say, whatever you want. My prayer for our church every single day is that we would be a place where it is the preemptive will of God is done quickly here. That he has his way here with us. Some of that's going to be struggles. Some of that's going to be movement of, of sacrifice. Some of it's going to be hard, but it's all going to end up glorious. I used to work with a guy in Santa Cruz, and every time I saw him, every single day, he would ask me, how's the war going? I don't even know what he meant by that. How's the war going? And he would ask me that, and I'd be like, uh. So I came up with an answer, and I decided I'd answered him the same exact way every time. Every time I saw him, how's the war going? We won. We've already won. We've already been given a glimpse into how God's going to close this whole thing out at some point. Evil's going to be defeated. Wrong is going to be made right. Injustices are going to be stopped. The king of kings is going to sit on his throne and his will is going to be fully accomplished across our whole planet. And so in the meantime... The way his will is going to be accomplished is with our hands and with our feet. So if you're not a follower of Christ, I would tell you that in Romans 10, it says this. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be. Not because you deserve it. Not because you came to a good church. Not because you're smarter than most but because of Christ and his promises and his work on your behalf on Calvary's Hill. If you've been away from Christ for a while, come back. We need you. There's so much to do. This is the most exciting journey on the planet. But there's a lot of challenge. We need your help. Come back. And if you're here and, and you say, well, I'm in, I'm in, lift up your eyes and say, God, what might you do 
if your will was really accomplished in us? Do you think, do you think even for an instance that we've arrived? <laughs> if you just know the thoughts I was filtering out as I preach, you'd know we're not arrived. If I just knew what you're thinking as you're trying to listen to me, we would know that we have not fully surrendered. We have not arrived. There is so much more that God wants to do. May it be so. May it be so. May it be so. Not so we'll be happy, but so God's kingdom will advance. With man, it's hard. It's not even possible. But with God, everything, everything is possible. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would move in such a way that we would raise our expectations and that you would wake us up to the things that you want to be about and that we would be found faithful and obedient to stand up in you. Raise our hands up and surrender to your will. May your will be accomplished in us and through us as if it were in heaven. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Stand up, stand up